Our next speaker is Professor Ehud Kalai from Northwestern University. Professor Kalai is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. His research is in game theory and its interfaces with economics, social choice, computer science, and operations research. Not, notwithstanding his important contribution, his contribution to game theory is far beyond a scientific contrib contribution. He was the founding editor of the journal Games and Economic Behavior, which has become the leading journal in game theory. Together with Professor Uman, he founded the Game Theory Society and served as its president between the years 2003 and 2006. He will talk about games with many players. Uh, it's an honor to be here, and thank you, Tzachi, Sergio, and Israel Arman for organizing this. For many of us, this is a very important event, and I'm happy and honored to be here, even though the occasion is not so happy. Uh, so, a minute. And I'm going to talk about games with many players, and subtitle is One Stood, One Stood Up, Out, and happy to present here. So let me first connect my history to David and then talk about some matters that are already, already mentioned here. So I graduated from Cornell in 1972 and my first job I took at a position of Marce at Tel Aviv University. Uh, <coughs> largely I chose Tel Aviv University because I wanted to be in the same institution with David Schmeidler who is the inventor of the nucleolus that I don't have to elaborate on here much, uh, was one of the heroes in my PhD dissertation. I was trying to generalize the nucleolus to games, NTU games, whatever that means. Uh, but it was one of the best decisions I made in my life, as David turned out to be a hero in many other respects, a teacher, listener, advisor, and a lifelong friend. Uh, to elaborate on the values and lessons I learned from him would take too long, and those of you who knew, who knew David, can just, I can just see him turning his head around with a burden and trying to not pay attention to what I'm saying. So instead, what I'm going to do, I will discuss two scientific issues that connect to my later research, two lessons and work, the conversations I had with him earlier. Uh, so let me first talk about games with unboundedly many players, and that was already touched on with Sergio and Bob Arman. Let me just give a slight connection as to my work and how I discovered the connection. So I published a paper in Econometrica, Large Robust Games, and the first theorem that was there that is asymptotically in the number of players, equilibria self-purify. What does that mean? If you play a mixed strategy equilibrium and there are many players and they are small enough, and Andy can elaborate on this later if we want, uh, if they are small enough and there are many of them, then the realized pure strategies will be equilibrium of the game. Uh, and they will, rep they will reproduce the same proportions of distribution over actions of various players. Well, when I saw this, then I remembered, of course, as Sergio mentioned, or Armand mentioned, is the main contribution of anybody who writes on this subject is the celebrated result of David Schmeidler from 1973, uh, in which he studied games with a continuum of players. And a major result there is that games with a continuum of players he formulated the, the, the such games and defined equilibrium and all this, but the major result, a major result there, is that games with a continuum of players admit pure strategy equilibrium. And when you look at these two results, you see a very interesting connection because if you look at the sh sh proof that Schmeidler gave, it was bri brilliant. He first looked at games with a continuum of players and used arguments similar to Nash's fixed point <coughs> argument to prove that they admit an equilibrium, possibly mixed, and then he proceeded to purify it by taking the, the proportions of players who play, take each, each strategy and allocated them to players in such a way that the distribution was the same as the distribution given by the, by the mixed strategy. But what was very nice connection between the two is I realized that in a way what this does, it 
take the burden of Schmeidler because the law of large numbers does the job for you. If you let nature play the game with high probability, what you get is very similar distribution to the distribution of mixed strategies when you have many small players. So in a way, you don't have to purify, you don't have to do all the work that David did now because you can let law of large numbers, just let them play, and what the pure strategy that you get is approximately Nash, equilibrium in pure strategies. And as the number goes to infinity, the, this, the discrepancy goes to zero. Uh, so I was very excited, and with some fear, I decided that it's time to call David and tell him about this result, but I don't want to elaborate, but those who knew David, I see some people smiling here, it was very hard to get, David was very uh, reserved and cautious, what's the Particular. <laughs> I didn't, uh, particular. So he, you couldn't get compliments easily out of him, he was very, before he gave a compliment, he really meant it. Uh, I took David to many coffee shops in Chicago, trying to please him and say, Luther, we have great coffee here. It was very difficult. So I was calling him with some fear because I didn't expect, it was, I thought it was like coffee. But to my surprise, he was very complimentary and supportive and really encouraged me to keep working on it. So I had complete trust in David and I put a lot of more effort in general, in seeing what I can get out of this result. And I got a much stronger result about games with large number of pairs. Are, extensively robust a term suggested to me by Sergio actually uh, which says that if a game has many players you don't have to worry about who moves first, who moves second, who leaks who make delegate to the strategy to others. A lot of the issues that may change the outcome of the game become highly unimportant when you have a game with many strategies. Let me change to another subject, games with n players not, inf not, con not, not uh, continuously many, but just, many, just more than two. And here is an opinion that I heard from David in 1974, actually. It must have been that he was still thinking about a continuum of players and games with many players. And he said the following sentence. Uh, the evolution of game theory, he said, follows a misguided path. It builds an n-person theory by generalizing the results obtained for the two-person theory. Uh, and such, it misses intuition of interactions that we observe by more than two players. I wasn't thinking about it when I was working on my, the paper I'm working now, but now in hindsight I see how it's connected to this. So my, the, question, the research I want to use it to illustrate how correct David was is I was studying the question together with my co-author, my son, Adam Kalai, and we were studying, is an equilibrium of a game credible? Whatever that means, and I'll illustrate. And would, what I mean by this, would players follow their ascribed strategies? Would they really play the equilibrium, or is it just something that we think? Uh, so there is a main theorem in our paper, and the theorem says that in the Van Neumann-Nash framework, and I'll be happy to elaborate for others later what I mean by that, of n-person optimization, there are exactly n distinct equilibrium concepts, C1, C2, <coughs> up to Cn. And if in a Venn diagram, here is a way to look at it. If I look at the solution concepts that we study from two-person games, the, the Venn diagram is like this. There is Nash equilibrium, an important subset, which is dominant strategy equilibrium. But if I look at the n-person game, the Venn diagram includes additional equilibrium concepts in between. So I still have the Nash equilibrium and the dominant strategy in between, but n minus two additional concepts, equilibrium concepts in between and this we don't see when we just start st study two-person games. And moreover, what's very important for the issue of credibility is that the center of the distribution is much more credible than equilibrium concept that when you get away from the center. So, and the subscripts is what we call critical mass. So lower critical mass means that you get more stable equilibrium. Let me give it to you by examples, and you'll see what I mean by that. So <coughs> let me show you an example. Suppose I have to party or not, and I have 12 people invited. 12, it's for Israel, Arman, it's 10. 12 people are invited to a party. 
uh, each can choose to attend the party or stay home. And suppose the payoffs are such that a player would rather go to the party if there are other people there, but she would, he would, she would rather not go to the party if she's going to be the only guest. So let me represent it by payoffs. If she stays at home, it's zero, but if she goes to the party, it's one if there are other people at the party, but it's minus one if she's the only guest. Okay, is the game clear? And let me look at the two pure strategy in Nash equilibrium and discuss the credibility and how it relates to Schmeidler's statement. So two pure strategy in equilibrium. One strategy is everybody attends the party and everybody's happy because it's not, she's not alone. All 12 people are there. And the other one is everybody stays home, which is an equilibrium because if everybody stays home, if I decide to go to the party, I'll be the only one and I'll pay, be paid minus one instead of zero. So these are the two, these are two Nash equilibrium. It's easy to see that these are the only two pure strategy Nash equilibrium. Because if anybody's at the party, everybody should be there. Uh, and if we discuss it some more, I think it should be easy to see that everybody at the party is significantly more credible than everybody at home. Just from intuition here. Everybody at the party is what we call critical mass of two, and what does that mean? If any two people go to the party, it's incentive compatible no matter what the others do. So if Marilyn and I decide we go to the party, we can do it, we are best responding to the profile of what everybody does, regardless of what the other 10 people do. In that sense, it's a critical mass of two. And the opposite, suppose everybody's at the party, if a number of people defect and leave the party, it's still best response for everybody to stay in the party, as long as the number of defectors is no greater than 10. So it can, it can sustain a lot of defections. And I'll refer to it as a nearly dominant strategy in a moment, because if it's the critical mass of two, if one person goes to the party, that's enough to incentivize everybody to go. So it's conditional and uh, dominant, given one going. On the other hand, everybody at home has critical mass of 12. Everybody is, it's incentive compatible to stay at home, but only if everybody stays at home. So it has critical mass of 12. It takes all 12 to participate in this equilibrium to make it incentive compatible, unlike the going to the party, which only two is in, are needed. So this is compatible only if all 12 go to the party and dually, Suppose everybody stays at home. If one person defects and goes to the party, defects from staying at home and goes to the party, then everybody actually wants to defect. So stability is destroyed by one defection, unlike here that you can sustain up to 10 defectors. So if you think about this for a while, you can see that everybody at the party is significantly more credible than everybody staying at home. Uh, and you can go back to the diagram, but if you look at just the two notions of Nash equilibrium and dominant strategy equilibrium, you cannot tell the difference between the two, even though if you think about it a lot, there is significant difference between the two. On the other hand, if we go to the intuition from the 12 people game, then if I look at where these two equilibria fit in this diagram, everybody at the party is at C2, where everybody is at home is at C12 and outside C11. So I need this intermediary concept which we get from thinking about n-person games, to differentiate between two equilibria that are drastically different, but if we don't have the intermediary concept, game theory doesn't allow us a description for the difference. So obviously, with this in mind to me, it means that Schmeidler was right. We really need intuition of n-person games to enrich the discussion for to have concepts that will be meaningful for, anal for strategic analysis to detect such differences. <coughs> So, to David, we miss you. Dahlia, the girls, everybody, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing him with us. I remember every time when I come to Tel Aviv, I call David and he would call Dahlia and make excuses and explain that he has, where is Dahlia? Uh -huh. Oh, hi, Dahlia. And I always felt bad for taking him away from you, and, but it was appreciated. Thank you very much.